and welcome to my talk about open source e-commerce with Alokai. Uh, my name is Filip Prakowski. I'm a co-founder and CTO of Alokai, and you may know this company before. Uh, it was called Viewstorefront, but we have grown quite a lot uh, since that time. We were no longer doing only Vue.js, so obviously we had to rebrand. And we we're also doing much more than a storefront. I'm also a tech council member of Mach Alliance. If you don't know what Mach Alliance is, well, in short, is an organization of enterprise e-commerce companies that are pushing composable uh, architecture to the market, advocating for it, uh, and setting the new standards, uh, basically, to drive innovation. And before I will do the actual talk, I want to start it by explaining why I actually think the content here is relevant to you, even if you don't work on any kind of e-commerce project right now, and maybe if you won't be working on any kind of e-commerce project right now. First of all, a fact is that there is an enormous number of e-commerce websites being created every year. In the last four years, it tripled, almost tripled. In 2001 alone, due to, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of e-commerce sites in the world has doubled, which is 200%, 204% year-over-year -year growth. It is huge. And it's super safe to say that almost every web developer out there, uh, including you as well, in our industry, will sooner or later have to build some sort of e-commerce website. By some sort, I not necessarily mean a state-of-the-art e-commerce website, but some sort of website that is accepting the transactions and working more or less in an you know, e-commerce model. While, in essence, the e-commerce websites are built with the same tools and it's to follow the same rules as other websites, in the end, it's, it's just an application, the industry has developed certain patterns of building them that aim to solve the problems that are very common and repeatable in almost any e-commerce store. And in today's talk, I want to share with you the essence, what I've learned in the last eight years in the e-commerce industry. So when the time has come, and you will build your first e-commerce application or maybe your next e-commerce application. You know how to approach it and how to solve those common problems. And if by any chance you will never ever encounter the challenge, you would still learn a lot from this talk because as I said, e-commerce applications are no different than any other applications. They just share a common set of problems and establish solutions that you can apply to any other application. So let me start by telling you a story of how Alokai was founded. And then you will understand why actually we embrace headless, why it's great, and we'll also learn how to build a great headless e-commerce application. So when I started my journey as a freelancer, it was more than 10 years ago. I chose the same path as I think most of the freelancers at that time. It was WordPress. It was so easy to build things with it compared to just, you know, coding them from scratch. You had an almost endless amount of plugins, themes, WYSIWYG editors. And as many of you know, WordPress has an e-commerce plugin called WooCommerce. And it was released, I think, around 2011, something like that. Uh, it was already quite popular around 2014 when I started taking e-commerce projects. And after years of doing it with WooCommerce, it was amazing. But after years of doing that, in a very easy way, let's be honest, I got a little bit bored with WordPress. So I started looking for bigger and more challenging products. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to get there as a freelancer. This is why I joined the software house as a front-end developer. And there I started working with Magento. I'm quite sure a lot of you, if you ever work in the e-commerce industry, you know this platform very well. It's one of the biggest e-commerce platform out there. It's built on PHP. It's super well known from its open source roots and a huge, huge international community. And at that time, there was very little successful open source e-commerce platforms. And the, the ones were also successful in the enterprise segment. You could really count on the fingers of one hand. And I think Magento was definitely the biggest one of them. Uh, Building Magento frontend was, you know, all PHP with a sprinkle of jQuery and some other ancient JavaScript frameworks like Prototype.js, for example. I'm quite sure many of you don't even know what this technology is about. And we had to work with that. It's nothing very exciting for a frontend developer, but it wasn't a problem exclusive to the e-commerce space. Like the majority of big enterprise applications look exactly this way. And I started complaining a little bit. 
uh, in my company. And a year later, I was moved to a different project that was an in-house product built with AngularJS. And this absolutely changed everything. Instead of having to deal with PHP code and jQuery, I was only dealing with the front end using the hottest JavaScript technology at that time. And I never ever touched the PHP backend. I had absolutely no idea how it worked. Uh, APIs, this was everything that I needed. And you know, despite having to deal with a completely new framework, this accelerated my work tremendously and allowed me to focus on the part that I really loved and understood well, while the other team, was focusing on the backend piece. So you'd say a perfect harmony, a perfect balance. Everyone does what they're good at. Compared to my experience with PHP commerce platforms, it was a whole new level of joy from coding. The code base was smaller, uh, so it was, I was able to understand it very easily as a whole. Communication with the backend based on the REST API, it was super elegant. The single page application concept introduced by Angular made so many frustrating parts of building dynamic UI just simple and, and quite enjoyable, to be honest, even though at that time it was uncomparable to what we have right now. A year or so later, together with my front-end co-workers, we started to wonder if actually we could have the same experience while developing the e-commerce applications. Uh, separation of front-end and back-end, it was very beneficial to the velocity of development, it was very beneficial to the quality of code, the scalability of the project, and you know, just pure satisfaction from the process, which matters a lot. You never should underestimate the motivational aspect. Uh, we knew that we didn't know much about this, though. So we did an internal evaluation of available tools. We looked at Angular. Uh, it was at that time Angular JS was already planned to be deprecated. Angular 2 wasn't ready. We looked at React. We looked at Vue. And out of those technologies, we actually looked at Aurelia.js a little bit as well. Out of those technologies, we choose Vue. And we built the first e-commerce boilerplate using Magento APIs with it. And because we had absolutely no idea how to do this right, because let's be honest, no one had, uh, we put this on GitHub, invited other agencies from the Magento ecosystem to collaborate on that. And well, this is how the first iteration of Alokai at that time, named Vue Storefront, came out. And at that time in the world of PHP, separating frontend from the backend was quite an innovative idea and it made a lot of noise in our space. This was 2017 and, well, a lot has changed since then. The concept of headless, the concept of e-commerce, API-first approach, it evolved, it matured a lot, and everyone learned a lot about it throughout the years. Also, Alokai itself matured a lot. Today, we're no longer a Vue.js-based framework for Magento, we're completely backend agnostic and support more than 10 e-commerce platforms. And we also support React. And even if not React, like major part of what we offer is basically completely framework agnostic. So you can use it with Svelte and, and everything else. So as I said, we learned a lot since 2017. And during this talk, I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned uh, in those last eight years of working in the e-commerce space almost exclusively with headless applications. So let's see how much I can fit in 20 minutes. Uh, I will try to fit most of it, or at least the most important aspects. So let's start with the basics. Uh, when we talk about e-commerce and modern technologies like React or Vue, we are talking about headless applications or headless storefronts. A headless storefront in its core is just an application that communicates with underlying technologies using APIs instead of performing all the steps required to output the view in a single place. In the world of modern JavaScript, uh, this application is almost always based on one of the popular frameworks. It is like Next, Next, Astro, sometimes Quick, Solid Start, this sort of things. It is almost always a meta framework. And they are using meta frameworks because SEO is absolutely critical for e-commerce. There is B2B e-commerce, where sometimes SEO not, is not critical, but as a rule of thumb, you should basically treat it as a must. Uh, so SSR is absolutely crucial in here. So we're rendering everything on the server side. This is how we can have great SEO. Uh, and you know, at this stage, when we are talking about our e-commerce application, we can say that we just have a regular Nike.js or Nike.js projects. And from there, it only grows. 
And most of the e-commerce frontends, they really look extremely similar and contain of more or less the same UI elements. And this image, I think, just illustrates how similar all of those things are. Like if you look at the components, most of those things could probably have exactly the same markup with a different styling. So you have elements like product cards, mini cards, product sliders, etc. So if it is so common to use exactly the same elements, it is probably smart to use a UI library dedicated to e-commerce just to accelerate your work and focus on you know adjusting those things to the branding of your project instead of building them from scratch over and over again. And this is exactly what we also thought at Alokai. So two years after releasing the first version of it, we released our own UI library that is called Storefront UI. It is completely open source. You can look it up on the internet. And also since 2019, it was completely rewritten to Tailwind. And now it also supports React and Quick. Uh, what makes it, I think, in my opinion at least, unique is that the components, they are not abstracted. You literally copy and paste them into your project. And from there, you can customize any aspect of them. And based on my experience, it is 10 times better way to accelerate the UI development than shipping component abstractions. They're often quite hard to customize further uh, than you know, some basic use cases like changing the color or fonts. Uh, when we talk about UI acceleration, it's best just to give a boilerplate code and then let people do whatever they want. But that's what we did. Uh, but the goal of this library is also to provide some additional granular building blocks like atomic components, like buttons, etc., that are actually black boxed and hooks or composables in Vue.js that will allow you to easily create very custom components that are not available out of the box with ease and just accelerate that. And for simple projects with relatively low traffic, having a dedicated UI library and maybe Stripe attached or some simple e-commerce platform like Shopify. It's often completely enough to cover most of your needs. Once the UI is done, you just connect with your e-commerce platform APIs, usually through some dedicated SDKs, and that's simply it. Don't let anyone tell you that you need more at this point, because all of that would be premature optimization. And I think premature optimization is pointless unless you're expecting a huge growth in a complexity in a short time, but you usually don't. Speaking of which, things are getting much more interesting when you need to ship something more complex. So when this complexity is actually coming from the day one, something more complex than a simple storefront with, let's say, 1,000 monthly visits connected to one third-party service or two third-party services, which basically just needs a, a proper UI. The first challenge uh, is handling bigger traffic. So if you don't want growing traffic to be associated with a linear growth of your infrastructure costs, you're probably going to invest into either SSR caching or just SSG with a CDN. And in both cases, you will deal with a session specific content. And you see modern e-commerce applications has a lot of session specific content. And at the best case scenario, it's like a user profile and card. In worst, worst case scenario, it's, it's basically all the content. All the content on the application is personalized. The prices are personalized. Uh, even taxes can be personalized because you have multiple, multiple tax years. Uh, so everything is personalized for the user by some third party tool that also tracks their behavior, collects information, and adjusts the layout and the content of the application to it. And to make caching effective, you cannot cache the session specific content. Otherwise, part of the UI for the user one will be shown to the user two, to user three, to user four, which is a ter terrible UX and often can even break the application in a completely unexpected way. So we definitely want to avoid that. Uh, by the way, I wrote a quite long article on that topic. So the first thing uh, you need to do is basically making sure that your session specific content is rendered only on the client side. Therefore, it is not cached because what we cache is like a server side output. Uh, and I will be using some examples from Next, but you can apply this knowledge to basically any other modern JavaScript framework. So Next comes with two great features that are helping us to actually render a session-specific content only on the client side. Uh, it comes out of the box with a client-only component. And well, as the name suggests, it will render the wrapped elements only in the browser, so only on the client. Yeah, so if you wrap all the session-specific elements with it, Half of your work is done. 
This could unfortunately lead to some issues with layout shifts and deliver poor uh, performance experience to your users while they're waiting for those components to be loaded. So it's a good practice to actually render some kind of placeholders on the server. So your users know when they should expect something to appear and when it appears, it's not changing uh, the position of the other elements. This way, you will avoid layout shifts. And here you can see a real world example of using placeholders in some older version of LinkedIn. You have exactly the same thing on Facebook and pretty much like all the applications that have loading loader than like two, 300 milliseconds. And obviously Next is not, not disappointing us here. Uh, it has a built-in mechanism for providing placeholders for client-only content with a fallback slot. So this way we can easily add a placeholder like a skeleton for each client-side rendered component. The second thing we need to take care of is data. Next, but also next, uh, and pretty much most of the server-side render frameworks, they're saving the data rendered on the server uh, in the HTML file. This way, they're avoiding fetching it again on the client side, which will be like double fetching exactly the same content, which is just a huge waste of time and, and bandwidth. So you will usually see this content at the very bottom of uh, your SSR file. If you in inspect this output, uh, you will see this as, as JavaScript object that is then being picked up by the framework. Uh, so you must keep this part clean as well, because it is also a personalized content. Luckily, Next is not disappointing us here as well. And the use fetch functionality that is being used to well fetch the data has a built-in property called server that you can just set to false. And this way, the content will be fetched only on the client. And that's it. And you can also test it. Uh, to test it, just uh, disable JavaScript in the DevTools and see like a naked SSR output. Uh, preparing for bigger traffic is not the only challenge that you will encounter when scaling your e-commerce application. Another one is data. Uh, we talked a little bit about data, but here the data in a little bit different context because large e-commerce applications, they consume a lot of APIs. And this introduces a lot of new potential problems. So we no longer have like one API for Stripe and one API for, let's say, Shopify. Sometimes we're consuming 10 or 20 or, or even 30 different APIs that has to work with each other in some way. So it is introducing a lot of new problems that just needs to be dealt with to keep the application scalable and clean. First problem or first challenge is performance. Usually each of those APIs that you're using on your front end, it is consumed through some kind of dedicated SDK. Each of them is adding a few dozen or even a few hundred kilobytes to your bundle. So this way you can very easily make your application clunky and slow even before adding any business logic to it, just at the moment when you're fetching the data. Uh, so the last one that I mentioned about uh, is the business logic needed to federate, orchestrate, and transform the data. The data federation is when we need to concatenate multiple APIs to get like a full set of data. For example, you can fetch price and product name from e-commerce, but take the product description from a CMS, and then we are federating this data together so we can display it on the product page. There is another term, data orchestration. Uh, this is when we need a sequence of API calls to happen. And this is resulting at the very end as something that we're outputting to the front end. And usually this works in a way that the sequence of API calls, every API call has some kind of result. And this result is becoming an input for the next API call, which is then becoming an input for the next API call. And then the last one is something that we're outputting to the front end. So doing all of that on the front end is generally an anti-pattern. You're not only increasing your bundle size with all the code and libraries needed uh, for that to happen, but also potentially increase the H HTML rendered on the server with a lot of irrelevant data, which is commonly known as overfetching. Not to mention that, you know, if you need that to be available in, let's say, some other front end, like a native mobile application, you basically duplicate the code because you have to put exactly the same logic there. Uh, so when you deal with multiple APIs and like large amounts of data, it's the best practice is you know to delegate that task to a completely different layer than the front end, and send it to the front end only, uh, you know from that layer, and only the data that actually needs to be explicitly rendered on the front end. So you can also strip uh, the data that you have on that layer from like some unnecessary fields. 
And this additional layer is usually called an API gateway. So it gets the data from all the underlying APIs, sends it to the front end, as simple as that. Uh, all the federation, orchestration, enrichment, data transformations, it is happening there. So the front end just gets a very simple and clean uh, data that is easy to display. It is getting it from only one API. So the whole complexity, it is, it is basically hidden. Uh, and on the front end, we also just install usually one SDK that is responsible for connecting with API Gateway. So at Alokai, this layer is called Alokai Middleware. Um, and Alokai Middleware is an open source library that you can use in any project, and it has a lot of out-of-the-box integrations, and it's completely that simple to install. So literally, what you need is just one file, you create a middleware server, and then another file with configuration. Uh, this file with configuration is called middleware config, uh, and it is really the only file you really need to deal with. Uh, when you want to add a new third party integration to it, and we have plenty of those available, you simply add it under the integration field, and that's it. You can now query it from the front end, and the response will go through the middleware. Uh, middleware has a very friendly extensibility system that allows you to basically override existing endpoints because every integration is exposing a set of endpoints and create a new endpoints and it's super handy for the data federation or data orchestration use cases that i was mentioning before for example here we can see how we shipped an extension that exposes a completely new get pdp pdp is an acronym for product details page endpoint that concatenates the product data from sap commerce with its descriptions from Contentful. So we're getting data from two sources, concatenating it and sending together from the front end. We're just querying one endpoint. We're completely unaware where this data is coming from. Uh, of course, we can also, you know, just uh, remove some of the fields that are irrelevant, etc. Like this is the power of having like a separate layer. By the way, we also ship a front end SDK for this middleware that allows you to fetch each endpoint as a fully typed function. And I think it's quite cool to have this type safety. And that would cover the key things to know about building complex e-commerce projects. So to summarize, the absolute essence of the stock, when you are building e-commerce storefronts, for simple projects, really everything that you need is just accelerating your work with UI libraries, uh, because e-commerce UIs, they are quite repetitive. Uh, then when we are starting to have some kind of scaling problems or scaling challenges, then we obviously need to think about cache. Then we should think about removing session specific content from the SSR output because this could break our application. Also, when we're dealing with multiple APIs, we should fetch the data, perform data related operations like data transformation, orchestration, data federation on a completely separate layer, server side layer. This will allow us to be uh, more flexible, also allow us to ship this data to more touch points, but also uh, just keep the front end as lean as possible because the front end should be just to display the data. Like there should be no business logic on the front end ideally. I know it's hard in the real world, but ideally there should be almost no business logic on the front end. That this is something that is being enabled by this additional layer. And of course, you know, this talk could be a full day masterclass, but believe me, if you get those things right, you will not only work smarter and faster, but every other mistake that you will make, it won't cost you so much. Because most of the projects that I've seen, like if, if they're failing on those things, they have to either rewrite the project or they are dealing with like a lot of issues along the way. So I hope you will remember that when you build your next e-commerce project, you will remember about those things. And also when that happens, please give Alokai a try. Thank you so much. Uh, and well, visit alokai.docs.alokai.com. And if you have any questions about Alokai, please let me know. Bye-bye.